in our third session now on Ephesians 1, 11 to 14, I want to focus on the purpose and the purposer. What's the purpose? We saw that last time. But especially focus on the purposer is identified in a certain way here. In him, in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance. Having been predestined, so the predestination is the way God is securing this inheritance for us. He chose us for an inheritance, and he, in that, secured it by nailing down our destiny. He predestined us according to the purpose. And let me pause here and name it one more time and then focus on the purposer and how he intends to secure the absolute infallibility that this purpose will come to pass. So, Father, as we focus on your purpose, we love your purposes, and we love you, and we love seeing how you secure the purposes that we so desperately want to count on and experience as we look, open our eyes to see you as the great purposer and your great purpose. And so establish us in joy and confidence and humility and faith. I pray through Christ. Amen. In him we have obtained in an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that, so here's why he is working all things, so that this purpose might come about, namely, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. That's the purpose being to the praise of his glory. And you see it again in verse 14, who is the guarantee, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the great purpose. Or as we saw back in 1, 6, chapter 1, verse 6, he predestined us for adoption to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. So three times, one, to the praise of the glory, specifically of his grace. Number two, to the praise of his glory. Number three, to the praise of his glory. That's the ultimate purpose. Now, who's the purposer and why does he say of him what he does? It's the purpose of him. This is God. And what he says about him is he works all things according to the counsel of his will. We saw last time that that means not according to our counsel. He doesn't counsel with us to see how he's going to do these things. He does it according to his own will. But what does he do? That's what I want to focus on here. He works. This does not say he works in all things. That would not be wrong. That's true. And even the word in is in the word work. But whenever the direct object in the accusative in the Greek, the objective in English, is not uh, a dative like working for all things or working in or with all things, nor is it a prepositional phrase with a little in here or with. Whenever it is a direct object in the accusative, it doesn't mean work in. It means bring about. It means effect. See to it that it happens. You can see that again if you look over 
at Galatians 3.5, where the same word is used with a direct object in the accusative, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles. There's no working in miracles or no working with miracles or no working by miracles. This is, this is a direct object. He works miracles. That's the same grammatical construction that we have here. He works all things. So working here means bring about, effect, see to it that it happens. God works all things. Now, this is breathtaking. This is probably one of the most sweeping statements about the sovereignty of God, the control of God, the governance of God, the providence of God over all things in all the Bible. Let me just give you a few parallel texts to uh, secure or uh, validate or enlarge your understanding of all things. This is the text we all love. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. That's because God is the one who works them. All things, no exceptions. Or Romans 11.36 for from him and through him and to him are all things. From him, all things. He's the origin. Through him, all things. He's the agent and to him, all things. They're for his glory. And so, not surprising that just like in Ephesians 1, the glory of God is the great goal. Or Colossians 1, 16 to 18, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, that in him, that in all things he might be preeminent. You can't miss the point that Paul wants to drive home the fact that all things are summed up in Jesus Christ, as we saw in 1, Ephesians 1.10. Or Isaiah 46, 9, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. I will accomplish all my purpose. And that's the point here of saying he works all things according to the counsel of his will. According to Isaiah, that's what it means to be God. I am God. There's none like me, and what makes me God is that my counsel stands. I accomplish all of it, all of it. Job 42, then Job answered the Lord. This is at the end when he's learned all of his lessons. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Or Jesus, on the details of God's sovereignty, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. The falling to the ground of a, of, a, of a sparrow that's not worth more than a penny is a very small thing, and God governs the smallest of things. And the greatest event in history, and the most sinful event in history, God is governing. Acts 4, 27, in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. So four groups, all of them sinning, Herod with his mockery, Pilate with his expediency, the Gentile soldiers nailing him to the cross and slapping him around, the peoples of Israel crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And they were all gathered together to do. You remember, he works all things. To do whatever your hand and your plan, that's that counsel, boule, that we saw last time, your plan had predestined to take place. So here's the point. In him we have an inheritance. What is that inheritance grounded in? Having been predestined. This is secure because it is our destiny according to God. 
And Paul doesn't stop there. He could have. But he says, let's take the, the predestination as deeply down into God as we can. This predestination accords with something, namely a purpose in the heart of God. And that purpose is that he will do everything to the praise of his glory. And then what does God do to secure that purpose so that we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that predestination will stand and therefore our inheritance will stand? And the answer is God undertakes in history to work everything, all things, according to the counsel of his will. God is sovereign. And notice this. Sometimes we get in arguments about the sovereignty of God as though it were some kind of academic point. It's, it's not an academic point. It's life. Look how Paul introduces it. He says, God is sovereign. He works all things. He works all things according to the counsel of his will, not our will. That is supporting God's purpose. That purpose is supporting predestination. Predestination is supporting our inheritance. If we don't make plain to our people or to ourselves the predestination and the purpose and the counsel of God and his sovereign working all things, how are we to, to expect a biblical confidence here? Paul believed that the sovereignty of God the counsel of God, the purpose of God, the predestination of God were all a glorious constellation of realities designed for every simple saint's confidence that they are getting an inheritance when they die. And that will sustain us in life and death and transform us and make us strong and steady, loving, humble people. Oh, God. Make it plain that such things are not simply to be argued about, but believed, loved, trusted, lived.